Have you come across, have you discovered any phenomena where you find experimental evidence for its existence, but you haven't yet found a rational explanation for it? For it? I think that's a, that's a very good question. Um, again, I wouldn't want you to go away. Sometimes skeptics, you hear skeptics saying there's no evidence to support the existence of telepathy, or there's no evidence to support the existence of precognition, all these other things. That's just not true. There is evidence. Um, there are papers published in peer-reviewed journals that sometimes claim they've got positive, significant results supporting the existence of telepathy or precognition or whatever. The issue is the quality of the evidence. Um, and then, of course, it does inevitably, when you're trying to assess complex sets of data and results, some subjectivity will come into that. So, I mean, I've kind of... I've moved from being a be somebody who used to believe in a lot of this stuff to somebody who is now very much on the sceptical side. So I'm very, very au fait with all the sceptical arguments and the weaknesses in the experimental evidence on the other side. But there is evidence there. And there's no such thing as a perfect experiment in, in science. So the, it, sometimes it, the, 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 the objection is made by the parapsychologists that we're using double standards. They have to produce evidence that's even stronger because of the prejudice against them. And I do have some sympathy with them in that. Having said all that, uh, I, am, I am not convinced. I think the occasional um, positive results can be explained. Not in, sometimes, it's, occasionally, it's deliberate fraud. But that's, quite, that's rare. And I don't think it's any more common in parapsychology than it is in other fields of science. What I think is a much bigger danger is what's been referred to recently as questionable research practices, where people are basically not quite perform, carrying out experiments and analysis in line with best practice. And, you know, they're kind of, there's all kinds of little examples of this. I really don't have time to go into it in, in detail now. But where you give yourself the benefit of the doubt. You've tried analysing your results this way, you don't get the result you expect. Oh, but if I try it this way, so you're having a second bite of the cherry and so on. And people don't realise how those little, you know, little crimes can actually distort the whole thing. At the end of the day, all science is about trying to separate the signal from the noise. I think if you ask the question, well, what would a science look like if it was all noise? I think it would look like parapsychology. <laughs> it may well be that there are things... I, I don't believe in anything paranormal, but I can well believe that there are some processes we don't yet understand. Oh, I'd accept that totally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, inevitably, none of us have got a kind of God-given judgment on these issues. So if you're going to kind of take and adopt a more sceptical position, you're going to say things have to meet a very, very high standard of evidence before I will accept claims. You're almost inevitably going to reject some claims that actually turn out to be true. If you go down to the other end of the continuum and say, well, you know, I'm going to accept any claim where there seems to be some kind of evidence that suggests it might be true, okay, you'll, you'll get all the true claims in your belief system, but you'll also get an awful lot that aren't true. It's like a kind of, you know, again, separating the signal from the noise. So, yeah, there are... I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be at all surprised if some of the claims that have been put forward... To give you a specific example, people used to once seriously put forward the notion that maybe bats navigate using psychic ability because they could, didn't know how they did it. And of course, when they discovered it was a form of sonar, suddenly that moves out of the realm of the paranormal and into standard physics and, and biology. Was there something there? There's a microphone there. Can you tell us what, it, what experiments you've actually done to prove what you're saying? Well, and have yeah. you and have you actually tried to uh, have you ever found anything that you couldn't explain? Well, two, two separate questions, both good ones. Uh, most of our, as I say, some of our research 
attempts to directly test paranormal claims. So in the longer version of this talk, I, I talk about an experiment we did um, to try and replicate a result which had been published in a standard psychology journal, not in a parapsychology journal, by a very well-respected uh, social psychologist called Professor Darrell Bem at Cornell University. He had published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, very well-respected journal, nine experiments, over a thousand participants, claiming to have produced evidence for precognition, that people could somehow sense future events before they happen. Um, and to his credit, he said, I want people to replicate this. And so myself, Richard Wiseman, and Stuart Ritchie decided we'd each try an independent replication. Um, long story short, we didn't get the effects that he got. We wrote up our paper, sent it into the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, and the editor rejected it without even sending it out for peer review. And we thought this was wrong because this, this, these, this research had had coverage all around the world. Obviously, the, the media were very, very interested in it. Uh, and if it was a true result, it was amazing. If it's not, then that's important as well. Um, but we couldn't sway them. Long story short, we eventually got it published in an open access journal called PLOS One. Um, and, that, and it generated a lot of interest. It was getting about 1,000 views a day, which is pretty amazing for a science paper. That's one example. I've done other, I've had PhD students, I've had others who totally believe in the paranormal and wanted to prove me wrong. None of them actually have so far. Um, but most of what we do is looking at the, the, the psychological factors that might make people think they've experienced something paranormal. So we've published a lot of papers of that kind. I mean, to give you uh, one example, um, we did an experiment. We followed up an experiment that Richard Wiseman and Emma Greening had published, looking at the effects of suggestion. And what Richard and Emma had done, they'd shown a video of an alleged psychic doing a spot of psychokinetic metal bending, you know, the kind of thing that made Uri Geller famous. Now, in fact, the person in the clip was a conjurer using sleight of hand. But the interesting part comes when, having bent the key using sleight of hand, he puts the key down on the table, and in one condition, the participants hear him say, if you look closely, you'll see it's still bending. And in the other condition, it's exactly the same, but they don't get that verbal suggestion. If you're in the condition where you get the verbal suggestion, 40% of the participants thought that the key carried on bending. It doesn't. You know, it's a huge effect with a very simple manipulation. Richard found that in two experiments. We replicated the experiment. We got the same effect. But we threw in another element. We had people watch the video in pairs and then discuss it. Now, in fact, only one person in the pair was a real participant. The other one was a confederate working with us who was either instructed to say, yes, it did carry on bending, or no, it didn't. Um, and in that case, well, if people were in the condition where they got the suggestion from the psychic plus the reinforcement from the co-witness, we got up to levels of 60% of people saying they thought the key carried on bending. So, I mean, I think it's important that the skeptics have to produce empirical evidence to show, for example, that the power of suggestion really is that strong, that it could account for people in a seance room saying, but I saw this happen with my own eyes when actually maybe it didn't happen. So you've never come across, you've never come oh, across anything... That was that the second you can't part of your question, I'm sorry. That um, no, I've, again, I wouldn't claim, I think it would be very, very arrogant to claim, you know, I've got a definitive knockdown explanation for every single claim that's been put forward. I haven't. And, but in actual fact, due, through either my kind of academic work or through taking part in TV programmes... I mean, I've spent more nights in supposedly haunted locations than is healthy for anybody. Um, and I've never, I've very, very rarely seen anything that has even begun to kind of challenge my scepticism. But there are a couple of examples. Again, I'm going to talk very briefly about them. A couple of documentaries I took part in. One was, which, which just left me thinking, oh, that is interesting. I wonder what is going on there. One was a program uh, of a little kid from Glasgow, very nice down to a horny little kid, but he claimed that he could remember a past life living on the Isle of Barra. And I haven't got time to go into detail of it, but there were aspects of that program that did leave me thinking, oh, that's interesting. I, don't know. I wasn't quite sure what was going on there. Another program I took part in once about reincarnation claims amongst the Druze sect in Lebanon, I came away completely convinced that I knew what was going on. Um, but and the second program that left me scratching my head a bit was uh, called uh, um, The Man Who Paints the Future. And it was an artist who used to think that his dreams foretold the future. He couldn't actually 
specify when the events that he saw in his dreams would take place. But what he would do is he'd have his dreams, he'd get up in the morning, he'd fix an image in his mind, and then draw a picture or paint a picture, maybe put a few notes on it. Um, then he'd toddle off down to his local Barclays Bank and have a photograph taken of him standing in front of the date thing. That was his way of trying to show, I didn't paint the picture after I heard this event being reported on the news. Um, some of the stuff, you know, one earthquake looks much the same as another, not that convincing, but there were some aspects that you thought, oh, that's interesting. So he did two pictures of the Twin Towers collapsing, one two months before it happened and one five years before it happened. The one five years before it happened was actually five years to the day. So you've got this kind of rather spooky picture of him standing there in the bank holding this picture, it's quite definitely the Twin Towers, and the date thing on the wall uh, giving the uh, date of, it was 9-11, wasn't it? So 11th of September. So, you know, um, you can explain it away. It could just be a coincidence. My role in these programs is to be the professional skeptic. But... Occasionally you come across stuff like that that I just kind of put in a mental box with a question mark on the top. <laughs>